today we're going to be talking about creating creatures. Now this applies for fantasy and science fiction. Obviously fantasy is always a little easier because with that, um, you can blame it on magic. You can be like, ha, magic's fault that for some reason this creature makes no sense. <laughs> Granted, you do have to have a reason why the magic makes sense. You can't just blame it on magic, otherwise that's lazy world building. You've got to blame it on a reason for magic. Like, hey, everything has wings because this wizard got mad that no this lizard couldn't fly it. So he's like, boom, everything has wings. Like, it has to have a reason. <laughs> it can't just be everything has wings because I wanted to. Yeah, I was watching a video today about <laughs> How far can you go with blaming stuff on magic? Yes, exactly. There is a limit to blaming it, stuff it on magic. So far <laughs> this building can roll on one wheel, and it's an entire city. It, it's half the size of the planet, and it, and it can roll, roll on one wheel, the size of a horse. No, right? It's in my in my moment. Oh, there we go. I was like, I knew I was spelling it wrong. This is why I always double check my document. Because <laughs> when I get nervous on screen, I tend to slip things wrong. So, um, but yes, you're right. Uh, with magic, there are only so many limitations that you can have. Um, if you guys have ever played Dungeons and Dragons, and if you haven't, um, a great example of it is all of the spells that they have in there. They try to make them really well balanced. Why? Because you cannot blame everything on magic. If you've also seen the Dungeons and Dragons movie, it's the same thing where Simon the Sorcerer is like, you can't fix everything with magic, guys. And they're all like, fix it. And he's like, I can't. <laughs> because magic does have to have limits. Um, the reason why we like magic to have limits and why people don't like the whole magic explanation all the time, um, especially with creating creatures, is because of the fact that even though magic can be enchanting and whimsical and awesome, like, don't get me wrong, I love a good old magical creature that you're like, it's fancy. That's cool. But at the same time, um, if you start blaming too many things on magic, that's when people start saying your story isn't realistic. And believe it or not, people do want their fantasy to feel realistic. Oh, I'll open the door real quick. Oh, sorry. The, the class next door was getting a little loud, so. <laughs> there you go. All right. But yeah, so that's why we don't like to blame everything on magic. It's because it gets a little old after a while and it starts feeling less realistic and more like just fantasy. And we like our fantasies to feel like we can live in them, right? You want to be able to step into a fantasy universe and go, yeah, if I lived here, it makes sense. You don't want to like live there and then be like, wow, nothing makes sense. The world is insane. The world is not just made of magic. <laughs> exactly. You can't just have everything be explained by magic. That being said. The planets were formed by magic. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, <clears throat> it true be true though, uh, you can have lots of things like that in your mythology within your universe, like um, gods and goddesses very much come into play, where you're like, and on this day, he made the second planet. That's when you can create your own religion like Miranda Sanderson does. <laughs> he does a lot. And it's because it works well, because people tend to go with the whole, ah, God created this planet. Solid. They, they like that explanation. <laughs> a lot of people are like, I can, I can vibe with that. Um, anyway, so we're going to explain um, how to create creatures not using magic first, just because of the fact that you're not always a, you might be writing a sci-fi, in which case fantasy does not apply here. <laughs> or you could also, um, if you're being writing a fantasy, want to have something slightly more realistic. So as a result, it's important to have all these things. So first thing you got to take into consideration is environment. Now, obviously, when I'm talking about environment, I'm talking about things like tundra and desert and forest and tropical, all these kinds of things. Now, the reason this is important is because each of these are going to have different creatures that have evolved to these things. So, for example, if they're in the tundra, they're probably going to have either blubber or fur. Having a furless creature in the tundra isn't going to make any sense. <laughs> Unless it's an ice dragon. Unless it's an ice dragon. But then again, see, there you go. It's evolved because it's ice. So it still makes sense. You gotta have some sort of logic to it. Or like you said, you gotta have some sort of ice in its veins. <laughs> um, and then with desert, you can, that's where you do have hairless and scaled creatures. Why? Because of the fact, or if you're doing magic, you can also do fire creatures here. Because of the fact that you got that heat, right? And so as a result, you've got to avoid that heat with your evolutionary standpoint. So 
the main thing that I'm saying with creating creatures is first make sure that you know where these creatures are living. If you don't know where they're living, you can't create an appropriately realistic mythical creature. Um, for example, a lot of the Greek mythological creatures are all centered around the Greek whole area there, right? And so as a result, they don't have a whole lot of big, fluffy, hairy beasts like in Russia. If you go to Russian mythology, you'll get a ton of like dire wolves with thick, massive fur, or, or giant bears that are going around clawing at people. Those, again, are all things that you're familiar with based on the environment, right? It makes the most sense. Whereas with Greek mythology, they have more of a kind of forested, semi-desert terrain. As a result, a lot of their creatures are more like horse, half horsemen and half snake people and things like that because that's what they knew. So if you're going to create a mythological creature, just remember that a lot of it has to do with the familiarity of the terrain because it makes the most sense. That's why people believe that they existed, is because it makes logical sense that they could exist, and therefore it feels more real and more tangible. That being said, obviously, there are more elements than just the environment. The environment is just the most important one that you need to take into factor first. All right, next one is originality. Now, you can absolutely borrow creatures from other mythologies. Let me tell you right now, there are some really crazy creatures in mythology that have never even been explored. You got your classic unicorn and fairy and satyr and whatnot, you know, those are all fancy. But there are a lot of creatures out there that aren't even originally, like, belonging to that person that people don't even know exist. Um, can't think of an example at the moment, but there is, I mean I can, but I can't remember what it's called. There is an Alaskan mythology, and there's this absolutely massive, like, creature. It's actually just, basically it's the equivalent of, like, if a gorilla and a polar bear were a thing. <laughs> like, it's huge, like a gorilla, and it walks on kind of all fours, but it can kind of get on no, two, kind of like a gorilla. But then it's massively furry and fluffy, like a polar bear, and it's white. Um, and it has something to do with curses. But anyway, I don't remember the full thing. <laughs> but the point is, I've never heard anyone write a story about that. That kind of sounds like a Sasquatch. It's a breed of different animals. Exactly. That's also true. <laughs> it kind of sounds like a Sasquatch or a Yeti, right? So it's kind of it's kind of funny because you've got all these different things that people haven't ever actually delved into. So you can absolutely use mythology as an inspiration. However, if you're going for originality, um, because a lot of us are. A lot of us want to create our own fancy creatures, right? Don't blame me. It's fun to do that. That being said, um, you want to make sure that when you describe them, you describe them in a way that shows that they're original. The reason why is because oftentimes I've seen this way too many times in fantasy novels where it's basically just a dog that's blue. You're like, excellent. Great job. It's a dog. <laughs> exactly. But they're like, it's like a dog. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't help me. Now I'm just imagining a dog. <laughs> when you say something like a dog, people go automatically, poof, it is that thing. You can't say that. You got, and especially because in fantasy, they wouldn't know what a dog is if they had this other creature, right? <laughs> so how can they say it's like a dog if they don't have dogs? Blue wool. <laughs> exactly. Blue domestic something. wool. But even then, you can start describing it. I would say the best way to keep originality, even if you're basing it off another creature, is start describing it the way you would describe it if no one had ever met a dog before. Act like you've never seen a dog before and look at a German Shepherd. Now try to describe it. Don't, don't say anything about it's like a dog anywhere in that sentence. And it seems totally original. Like if I started describing a German Shepherd to you and as if I'd never seen one before, it sounds so much more original, right? Even just, I can only imagine that your gears are kind of turning and thinking about how would you describe that. It sounds more original, right? It just does. <laughs> Whereas if I say German Shepherd, it's like, huh. <laughs> but if you, uh, like, describe it as like this sleek, muscular animal on all fours with massive paws and very um, straight pointed ears and this dark, luscious fur, you're, you start getting a different image, right? It starts I feeling a different. Giant dog that is super, super hairy and black. <laughs> but see, there you go. It's like you start getting this originality feel because of that. So as a result, take your creature, and if it's based in another creature, 
describe it as if you've never seen that creature before. Because technically, if you're making up your own creature, you haven't ever seen that creature before. Right? It doesn't exist. <laughs> so just try, so with originality, even if you're basing it in another animal, just make sure you do your best to describe it in a way that you don't compare it to anything. Try not to use similes, try to use metaphors and basic descriptors. Because um, that's going to help it feel more realistic to your uh, reader and make it feel a little bit more enchanting and whimsical. <laughs> All right, next is the why. Now, we kind of talked about this with environment, but it's slightly different. We're going to go back to blue dog. So <laughs> that's sometimes I pick an example, and that's just where I stay. Um, so why? It's important to know the why of your creatures because of the fact that, for instance, with the blue dog, if you have no blue foliage and the dog is blue, why? Biologically, that would not make sense. <laughs> you wouldn't want it's to be blue. Mutated <laughs> exactly. If it's a mutated creature, sure. Or if it has ice abilities and so it doesn't matter that it's blue because it's normally so powerful people don't mess with it anyway, cool. But if it's like, hey, I want to blend in with my terrain, why would you do that? It would be like a zebra being like, I want to blend in with black and white grasses, so I should be black and white, striped. That seems sensible. And then the zebra says, no, you know that's lame though. What if I did pink and purple polka dots? That's a good way to evolve. And you're like, no! <laughs> you're gonna get yourself killed. You're going to stink. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So if you have any creatures like that that are kind of weird and don't make sense with the environment, you've got to have them be rare or almost extinct or things like that. Because of the fact that realistically, that would be the case. <laughs> it's like with pandas. Why are pandas almost extinct? Yes, we are getting rid of the bamboo environment, but they're also really, really stupid. <laughs> so, as a result, it makes sense. <laughs> Hello. And so, with that being said, you gotta make sure you keep track of the why for your creatures. Just because it does tend to be a little bit interesting. <laughs> Trying to have creatures in your thing that don't make a whole lot of sense. Here, move my back half. I killed the eraser. Okay. <laughs> so, back to the blue dog. If you're going to have a blue dog, <laughs> for instance, if that's really, you have your heart set on, I want my dogs to be blue, then why not make all your foliage blue? Doesn't that make everything cooler anyway? You have freaking blue trees. I want a blue tree. <laughs> like, not opposed to that, man. <laughs> so, if you're going to do things like that, you've got to make other instances in your environment as to why this makes sense. Um, so, we have that. Um, and then like with the zebras, if you want them to be pink and purple spotted zebras, for whatever reason, um, you gotta have maybe the shadows in this realm are pink and purple spotted, or the sunlight is pink and purple spotted. When they sit in the sunlight, you can't tell them from the sunlight. <laughs> so, if you want things to be unique and original and not make sense with the environment, you have to change your environment to make sense with the creature. One of them has to get changed. Either the environment changes to suit the creature or the creature changes to suit the environment in your world. The reason I say in your world is because obviously that's not how real life works. <laughs> I wish the environment where I could just be like, what if I just, this tree now grows milkshakes? That would be awesome. But that's not how the environment actually works. <laughs> but in your world building, please go for that. Um, all right. Now, obviously, this one's kind of a no-brainer, but hey. Get some inspiration from real life creatures. If you have a snowy tundra area, look at what creatures live in the snowy tundra areas. And then say, okay, what if I took a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and poof, new creature, right? All you have to do is take some little bits and pieces from each one and you have a whole new creature. Or you could also do different things in real life like with mutations. Have you ever looked up just random mutations in animals? It's insane. <laughs> it's crazy. There are cats with like four eyes and things like that. <laughs> they actually exist and they're alive. <laughs> but why would they need four eyes? Then you have to explain, okay, with these random mutations, why would they stay? Or, like with your book, if it's science fiction, you can be like, big nuclear explosion. And then a lot of mutations happen whether or not environment thinks they are good. <laughs> that being said, um, it still makes sense if you're going to keep those mutations. Either keep the radioactivity in the area, if you're doing a sci-fi, or if you're doing a fantasy, keep the wild magic in the area, because wild magic. 
We all love Wild Mash. <laughs> it's a good, fun explanation. But you still can take those real life mutations and make them make sense in your story. For example, if I wanted to have a cat with four eyes, I could say, well, it um, enhances their vision because this pair of eyes can see perfectly in the dark and this pair of eyes can see perfectly during the daytime. So as a result, you don't even know they have four eyes because usually one pair is closed. <laughs> or something like that. Not necessarily have to do that, but you can have all sorts of different explanations for that, although cats already kind of have twilight vision, but not full dark vision. Anyway. <laughs> Um, well, some cats do. Anyway, <laughs> debatable. I'm getting on a tangent. Um, real life creatures can actually be really fascinating, and especially looking into why they are the way they are in real life. Um, the biggest thing that I think is the most fascinating about real life creatures is things like in the deep sea. I think if you want to create a really unique creature, definitely look at some deep sea creatures. Because those things have evolved in the wonkiest ways. Freaking blobfish? <laughs> things well, like that. You're like looking at it like, why? <laughs> so, um, granted, those have evolved to be part of the deep sea, so you've got to take that with a grain of salt and say like, well, maybe this thing wouldn't live on land so well unless I changed it to X, Y, and Z. Um, and sometimes domestication can mess animals up too. Um, <laughs> it's funny, because people would like to think domestication's great, but not always. Pugs, man, they cannot breathe through that nose. They're so cute, but that nose is useless. <laughs> um, they have so many breathing problems. So do, you can also explain creatures through domestication and be like, well, this creature can't breathe through its nose. Why? Because humans wanted it like that. <laughs> you can always do that humans wanted it like that explanation and people are totally gonna be like, huh. Yeah, that makes sense. Because it's true. There are a lot of things like that. And then I mean, even with Siamese cats, um, I don't know how this happened. I don't think it was a purposeful trait, but a lot of Siamese cats are cross-eyed. Why? <laughs> no one knows. All we know is that all the purebreds, you can almost always tell that they're a purebred because they're going <laughs> um, Or they have what's called nystagmus, where their eyes go like this. So it's really hard for them to focus because their eyes are constantly twitching. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but that's a thing with Siamese, and I think it's just because they've been interbred for too long. Um, but that happens a lot with interbreeding and domestication. So if you have any sort of domestication process in your book, whether it's science fiction or fantasy, you can say things like, this creature ultimately, um, or like chickens. Chickens oftentimes um, in this day and age have been so domesticated to the point where we breed them for food, right? Um, as a result of breeding them for food, a lot of them are so like top heavy with meat that they can't walk. Not functional, not something the environment wanted, no, but it's something that people did. <laughs> so if you're like, hey, I really want this creature to be super fluffy, even though it has no reason to have this fur. Well, maybe you say, well, this fur is so valuable that people started cultivating it for this fur specifically. And so as a result, this poor creature has like fur forever and you just can't get rid of it. It's just everywhere and it can't move because it has so much fur. You could totally do that. You could do like this creature just sits there and just, because <laughs> it's just covered in fluff and can't move. <laughs> you could do that because that's the thing that humans do with um, domestication of animals and animal breeds. Um, do you guys have any questions? So far, I talk really fast, so I'm going to take a minute and slow down. Do you guys have any questions about um, building creatures off the environment, originality, um, why they need to be the way they need to be, or getting inspiration from real life creatures? I have some more things that I want to go through, but I'd be happy to slow down for questions real quick. Anything? We're good? Okay. <laughs> I just know sometimes I. Whew, don't stop talking. I just go, phew. Anyway, <laughs> all right, let's get into the next fun topic. Boop. This will be your favorite topic. <laughs> Hybrids. Um, now, depends on whether you're doing a science fiction, a fantasy, and whether or not radioactivity is involved. Those are all important factors. Why? Because with radioactivity, um, like I said, poor mutations can happen that are not necessarily supposed to happen. There are lots of times where animals are exposed to, create, uh, to radioactivity and they're like, we have six legs now. We had four before. Don't know where the six other two came from, but they do. <laughs> so like, 
there, I, I would say that's something you do need to include is like random mutations where they're just like, this makes no sense, but it has it like anyway. Like having it join. Exactly, it's just like, okay, why? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but because, guess what? Radioactivity is it, boom, mutation. Because it, it, that's a thing, unfortunately. A lot of radioactivity causes these insane amount of intense mutations. Like a fourth a monkey with four, with four, four joints of time. Yep. You did think that was cool. <laughs> so those kinds of things, they, even though they don't make sense, they make sense because radioactivity is known for doing those kinds of things. Like I said, cats with four eyes and, and foxes with six legs. And you're like, why? And it's like, because of radioactivity. There was yes. actually a bunch of rabbits that mm -hmm. were like, drinking from a stream downstream from like an nuclear mm -hmm. plant and they started pooping glowing poo. <laughs> there we go. See, glowing poop, <laughs> glowing rabbit poop. It makes sense. Yep. <laughs> Radioactivity does all kinds of weird things to animals. It's sad, but it's true. Granted, it also does weird things to people. But <laughs> generally, the animals are the ones that suffer because we know to stay away from radioactive areas where adorable bunnies go, I don't care. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> Um, so with hybrids, um, you can go the radioactive route and be like, whoosh, throw all logic out the window because radioactivity is crazy. <laughs> or um, you can go the more logical route. Now this one is going to take longer than my other sections because I actually have taken a class in genetics. And so as a result of that, I hope this is helpful for you. You don't have to necessarily follow this if you're doing fantasy. However, I will say that a lot of... Um, Fantasy nerds love this kind of thing, where you're like, actually, because of this, and they're like, oh, cool. <laughs> this is when you get Brandon Sanderson-y, and you're like, hmm. <laughs> All the world building. Also, science fiction. If you're doing science fiction minus the radioactivity, it's important to note. So, with species creation, this is the best way I know how to explain it simply. If you have two different species that start out as the same species, how this kind of stuff happens is generally because of some sort of environmental factor. So for example, you might have a salamander, point one. And then you have salamander version two and salamander version three. And they're totally different mutations of this same salamander. But the reason why is usually because of something like a giant mountain range, which pretend it looks like a mountain range. <laughs> and so as a result of that giant mountain range, half of them got split up from the other half of them. And so even though these two could probably interbreed for quite some time, once you get seven generations down the line and you're still being separated by this mountain pass, these guys have interbreeded so long that they've become entirely different species. And so as a result, those two no longer mix. You can no longer blend those genes. So if you have any creatures that are um, incompatible. Sometimes it can be an environmental factor. Sometimes, um, if they're close. So, for example, um, horses and donkeys are a good example of this. They look very similar. They have a lot of the same traits. They probably came from the same ancestor, but they cannot interbreed without creating a sterile offspring because it functionally just doesn't quite click anymore because they've been too domesticated in entirely different ways. Um, meanwhile, you also have the example of where they can't interbreed, period. Um, now, there's a lot of things that make it so that animals can't interbreed, period. There are obviously breeding season differences. So like maybe there's two, uh, there's two forms of fantasy foxes in the universe. Like one is psychic abilities and the other is talking but they can't interbreed because the psychic ones only breed in the spring and the talking ones only breed in the fall. Now you can't have talking psychic foxes. You can just have psychic and just talking. <laughs> so that makes it so that it separates. Um, How do they know that they're psychic if they can't talk? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Anyway, <laughs> um, you can also do different things like um, they are incompatible genetic-wise. So sometimes this can happen depending for a variety of reasons. Um, like with the salamanders, it could just be that they've become two entirely different species over way too long. Um, it could also be the fact that they never met before. So for example, um, lions and tigers can interbreed and um, create ligers, but ligers are completely sterile. They can't produce more ligers. 
Um, where And part of the reason why of that is, again, because they're just too different. Granted, you can also have incompatible genetics to the point where they cannot rebreed. So for example, I um, can't think of a particular time that this has happened that people have like, reported it, but there are all sorts of instances where this happens, like different types of frogs. There are different types of frogs where like poison dart frogs, I believe, and regular American frogs that are not poisonous. They can't interbreed because of the fact that their, their breeding season's the same, that's not a problem. They're in the same, you can put them in the same tank, so then there's no longer separation of distance, no longer a problem. But then the, it just comes to incompatible genetics. How do their genetics blend, or not blend in this case? Um, with the production of a new species, a lot of things have to go into play. You know, different genetics have to blend well. And if the poison gene goes, hey, I'm super intense now because you don't have any poison genes, it could poison itself, right? That's a problem. <laughs> then you also have the problem of it could have too weak of an eggshell because maybe the poison dart frogs have a stronger eggshell, I don't know, and the American ones don't. And so as a result, the egg can never properly be fertilized because it's not functional. Um, so there's just a lot of different things you need to take into consideration when creating a science fiction story. However, if you're not doing science fiction and you're doing fantasy, you can just do this for fun if you want. <laughs> if you want to just be like, and this can help you explain it in a way that's not magic. A lot of people say, oh, well, if I have a species of foxes that are psychic and a species of foxes that are talking, um, I'm just going to say they can't interbreed because magic. That's one of those ones where you're like, eh. <laughs> makes less sense. You can blame it on magic, but it's not going to be as cool. So it's a lot better to say things like, oh, well, they breed in the fall and the other breed in the spring, so you can't physically breed them. The end. <laughs> and then people go, oh, it's logical, it makes sense, and they just move on. Um, these kinds of things are things that you can slip into your story and make it not only make more sense, but enhance the world. Then people can be thinking about, like, oh, all these sorts of crazy things. Because people like to think about the crazy, fun world building stuff. That's why we like things like Brandon Sanderson, because he does all the crazy world building stuff that we're all not willing to do. <laughs> um, that being said, we're now going to talk about. Oh, I didn't erase that thing. Okay. We're now going to delve into, for those of you that are doing fantasy, magic. So. Um, with explaining things with magic, you just gotta make sure that you write things down. Um, if you have an explanation and you're like, hey, these two species can't interbreed because these types of magic don't interbreed, that's another good explanation. Where you're like, dark magic creatures and light magic creatures can't breed together because it just physically is incompatible magic. That's cool. Um, but you gotta make sure you write that stuff down because you're gonna forget it. And then two seasons later, uh, two seasons, <laughs> two books later, you're gonna be like, and boom, half magic, half light thing. And everyone's gonna be like, well, nah, 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 nah. no, <laughs> no, you can't be doing that. You said no. <laughs> so you gotta make sure you write these details down just so that way you don't forget and then accidentally break your own rules. Granted, that's what editors are for, but every once in a while, editors don't catch those things because what do people do? <laughs> So even though professional editors like me, we look for those kind of things to help enhance your writing and help make sure you don't have those pitfalls, doesn't mean that we'll always catch it. I would like to say I have a 99% catch rate, but that's still 99%. There's that tiny little percent that says it could slip through my radar. That's a problem. <laughs> so you probably want to keep track of it on your own. Um, that being said, with magic, You've also got to figure out what your magic system is for your creatures. If your creatures are involved in your magic system, you've got to make sure that they make sense within your magic system. So you've got to make sure that your rules and regulations make sense with them. You've got to make sure that if they have any sort of stipulations, like dark and light creatures can't interbreed, then do they live in different places? Do they avoid each other altogether? Do they fight all the time? Are they predator-prey kind of situation? Um, these are all important details to think about, just to consider. You don't necessarily have to go into them, but you can consider them. All right, and then just for fun, I wanted to take a minute and take all the rules that we just had, and let's create a fun creature. <laughs> I'm glad one of you seems excited. The rest of you seem like very focused. <laughs> all right, um, let's let's either have throw out some ideas. Where do we want this creature to live? 
Okay. Cliffs around an ocean. Cliffs around an ocean. I like it. All right. A cold ocean. Cold ocean. Good specification. All right. So with that, that's we have the environment. Now, do we want it to be original, or do we want it to be more based in reality, but a little skewed? Do we want to start from scratch, or do we want to go, this cool creature sounds nice, let's make a weed. <laughs> cool creature sounds nice. Based off a penguin. Yeah, based off a penguin. Ooh, okay. So we have penguin for a base. How are we going to screw up this penguin? <laughs> we gonna mess More it up. And <laughs> Make it weird. <laughs> More veils in different dimensions to catch fish in the air. Ooh. Okay. Okay. That, I mean, that makes sense. It's like cows have three stomachs in order to be able to digest things easier. All right. So, anything else that we want to add? is in a different plane of existence. Okay, so with the magic, how are we gonna explain that with the magic? This is why it's important, let's dive into this. Because <laughs> each plane of existence has a different type of fish that's more plentiful that gives them different nutrients. Ooh. It's like a blue they dog. To be alive. Different dimensional nutrients. Interesting. Okay, how are they supposed to be able to see all these different dimensions? It's like a blink dog. It's like a blink dog. Interesting. Okay, for those of you who don't know Dungeons and Dragons, blink dogs are very fascinating. They can definitely they can jump between different dimensions. So in that case, they can catch this kind of fish with this bill, and this kind of fish with this bill, and this kind of fish with this bill. But they kind of they're at the end of dimensions. Okay. Anything else we want to add to this interesting penguin? Because I doesn't have wings. Why does it not have wings? <laughs> Instead okay. of wings, it Instead has wings. tentacles. Ooh, okay, so that would help push it through the water, because I was like, the only problem with getting rid of the wings is it has no way to propel itself now. So the tentacles, there we go. Okay, and that would actually make sense because we have a cold ocean, and on top of that, these tentacles could help it to once again catch more fish. Okay, okay. This is really crazy penguin. <laughs> do you want to try to draw our penguin over here? Uh, do I? Is that? Nope, nope. It's going to be over here because I have more board over here. No, uh, I'm going to match up slightly chubby. Because I like chubby penguins. Oh, it's also really short. Oh, it's also really short. Okay, here's a normal penguin. Here's this penguin. <laughs> there we go. It is 3.49. Okay, not good. That's terrifying. All right. <laughs> um, let's give it a rhinoceros horn. Yeah, why do, why does it need the horn? Head, we gotta have a reason. It does bore through eyes. It has a... Ooh, I actually like that. Kind of the narwhal thing going yeah, on here? Yeah, it's the narwhal thing. Okay. Um, Draw a horn can be straight up, so we're gonna go with narwhal horn and go like this. Okay. Burp, 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 burp. Narwhal crazy thing. See, there you go. We just created a super original, unique creature. I'm pretty sure this does not exist in any book that I've ever read. Suddenly, someone comes <laughs> in. Have you read this book? It has a sport dog, blink dog, tentacle, oh narwhal. That means so sad. But the point is that you can create a cute... I don't think anyone would be able to think I know, that right? right? <laughs> this is now going to be posted on the internet, though. So it's, it's now uh, the lore of the, the Writers Club. <laughs> air, 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 we're going to do Air Writers Club TM. We have Shrimpy in that penguin. Oh. <laughs> All right. So with this, this, see how easy that was, though, when you apply all these principles? It's so easy. 
like, <laughs> it's funny because people are like, it's so hard to create a unique and original creature. And I'm like, not really. You got the environment, and then you take specific specifications to the environment, you take a real life creature, and then you add some creatures from other real life things or from magical things in this instance, and poof, you got yourself a pretty unique, interesting heckin' creature. <laughs> I would not want to find it. <laughs> no, no, give it find it alone on the dark night. No, oh, give it man. Mantis rip. I am Mantis rip. Poof. <laughs> Boils the terrifying. water. Boils the water and hits it so hard. <laughs> so, why does it need the Mantis rip clause if it already has all Back of these other things? Predators. Okay. Because to, to the to humans control. will go out onto the ice, wait until it comes out and breaks the hole, and then they'll Ooh. put it, then they'll break a hook through, hook it, and pull it out. I see. Um, so the humans, the humans also, desire this animal. It might taste good or something like that. Okay. It also has predators that hunt it. Um, so it needs a little. Uh, and it and can. They hold. can. They're immune to any of its other defenses, but not mantis shrimp. Claws. Not mantis shrimp claws. I like it. Uh, <laughs> That's not the best mantis shrimp claws, but we're going with that. And it can only change through different dimensions when it's underwater. I like that. that I like that underwater specification. Uh, that, that way it's not changing two different dimensions. Exactly, that way it's easier to catch two for people because if it pops out of the water and the person's like, ha, dinner tonight, poof. They can't just poof out of existence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't just poof out of existence. You you got it now. You, you got delicious, I don't know what to call this, for dinner. <laughs> uh, it would have an interesting delicious. texture. <laughs> <laughs> As a person who's eaten octopus, that would have been Blake interesting. Blake Oxta Manta nor, nor Penguin. Yeah, I think at this point we need to come up with our own name. Because <laughs> that hybrid name, no one's ever going to remember that. That's cool, but oh man. I, I'd be like, that thing. I'd never call it by its name. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to... We're going to... Um, yeah, how do you name your mutations? How do I name my mutations? That is an excellent question. Let's so name it. Nice. Steven. Steven. I usually start with a letter that I like. I look at the creature and go, what letter do I like? And then I start with that letter and then I just kind of let it, my brain, like think S. about the possibility. Well, I like the, S. Steven. Or you got the Jennifer and Nielsen route. That's true, just the Jennifer and Nielsen route. You just smash the keyboard and then go, huh, what looks nice? Yeah, so we're going to start with an S. Um, any other letters that we think sound good with S? Do we want to uh, sound with S? V. <laughs> Smooth. Okay, where are we going with this? We need a couple uh, of vowels, people. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sounded awesome, but I could not spell that for the life of me. S U S U V U V. S okay. We're we're changing it up here. S U V. I didn't mind. I can try. That's what it sounded like to me. Yes. <laughs> Sounded Nordic. <laughs> it was because my Chromebook was in Russian. What? <laughs> that's wild. All right. So, um, yeah. So that's for me with my hybrid mutation creatures. I generally like to come up with an original name, just because if you just basically call it like cool lizard for a dragon, that <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna come up with a cool, unique, creative creature, definitely try to have something Spit cool out and a unique. Bunch of random syllables. Yes. I think a cool thing you could add to the story though was okay. if you had this character mm -hmm. or this creature in this a creature. story and you were trying to like make them be kind of like the hero or something. Ooh. Maybe the hero takes one look at the name and is just like, you know what? I'm gonna call you Steve. Yes! 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 Steve, I love it. He's trying to befriend the he was trying to befriend him and he's like, dude, that name sucks. It's kinda not that it sucks. It was great. But he's like, it's not a name that I can pronounce, so we're gonna go with Steve. <laughs> and a um, wizard or person like get together and they're like, yes! Uh, the penguins. The penguins. <laughs> no, Momo. Yes. I got so and attached Momo. to Momo. Exactly, you get so attached to Momo because you meet the little, fly, uh, little flying lemur and you're like, oh, whatever. But then he names it Momo and you're like, I love you forever. <laughs> <laughs> because you're connected to it. <laughs> uh, but yep, so there you go. All right, so 
that is my recommendations for how to create a creature. Um, again, with the naming part, you can really do it any way that you want. Um, it's kind of bonkers, so you can name it any way that you'd like. Um, if you guys want to take a picture of it, please do now because I'm going to erase it afterwards. <laughs> but it's going to be on YouTube, so if you ever need a reference back to this, no, never erase it. It'll be on YouTube. I wish I could say that, but I can't. I have to. I, the, this board belongs to the library, not me. But it Just is. What? You, just, just, write that, YouTube. just write that all back, then we'll take the board off and we'll go quick buy another board and put it there. Oh, we'll just keep that video. board. <laughs> uh, all right. So, no, Steve. Steve. Well, he is forever live, going to live on YouTube now. So, if you ever miss Steve, it's you can check alive. out YouTube. No. <laughs> Actually, that was just me with. Yep. That was the orange. All right. That was that, that was the larger one for size because you said he was short and I was like well I can't make him short unless we know how short he is no so that being said all right is there any other questions that you guys have feeling pretty good about this all right then I'm going to stop the video here